This is America's Roundtable from Washington, D.C., a weekly radio program with leading voices from America and the globe, representing the academia, business, think tanks, and the political arena. I am Joe Alan and Sami, your co-host, joined by Natasha Sardorch, economist and chairman of the think tank Adriatic Institute and co-founder of the International Leaders Summit. This weekend, we are pleased to have as our special guest, Dr. Daniel Kaufman. Daniel Kaufman is a senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. His areas of expertise include public sector and regulatory reform, development, governance, and anti-corruption. Previously, he served as director at the World Bank Institute, leading the work on governance and anti-corruption, where he pioneered new approaches to measure and analyze governance and corruption, helping countries formulate action programs. In the early 90s, Kaufman was the first chief of mission of the World Bank to Ukraine, and then he held a visiting position at Harvard University. Dr. Kaufman is a member of the Advisory Board of Transparency International, and during the next month, he will take up a new post as president of the Revenue Watch Institute in New York. Natasha Sardoch and I thank you for joining us, Dr. Kaufman. Thank you. We would like to take a moment and look at some of the broader issues when looking at events unfolding in Europe, specifically when observing the Greek crisis. Our listeners on America's Roundtable have followed our interviews with leaders looking at Europe since the transatlantic community and economy is interconnected, and Europe's problems does impact our American exports to Europe and therefore FDI from Europe into the U.S., In essence, Europe's economic challenges affects jobs and investments in America. Dr. Kaufman, the the Wall Street Journal, Marcus Walker, uh, mentioned about your study stating that, I quote, you found that bribery, patronage, and other public corruption are major contributors to the country's ballooning debt, depriving the Greek state each year of the equivalent of at least 8% of its gross domestic product, or more than 20 billion euros. Unquote. Now, this crisis has cost EU taxpayers over $163 billion in 2010 and 2011, a second package of $178 billion in bailout funds. Dr. Kaufman, how serious is systematic corruption in Greece, and how did this lead to the Greek crisis? Thanks, Joel and Natasha, for, for this opportunity of having this discussion with you. Uh, and let me backtrack for a second that this was part of an analytical and and data evidence-driven study where first I asked a much more general question. Contrary to popular belief, I asked, is it the case that developing countries are always those that are afflicted by corruption, high levels of corruption, and the developed industrialized world is usually not totally devoid of corruption because there's always some corruption, but relatively clean and full of integrity. And I looked in particular at the diversity among industrialized countries and what was very clear in the data which we have constructed in terms of governance indicators and corruption indicators is that there is enormous variation on corruption as well as other governance dimensions across the industrialized rich world ranging all all the way from the Nordic countries and New Zealand, which are absolutely uh, models in terms of integrity and and governance on the one extreme, and then countries like Greece and Italy, which rank around the world around the 100th position. In fact, there are quite a few emerging economies and developing countries, including my own, which is Chile, which rate around the 20th or 30th rank around around the world, very much like where the United States is, which is not the model in this case, but it's it's not where where Greece or Italy is, to where Greece and Italy, which is between the 90 and 100th uh, rank. So that was the, the first finding in general of the study. And then I asked the question, well, does it matter to what extent this corruption Um, affects the public finances of the country. And in particular, I I looked at the issue of of fiscal deficits and the probability of of a financial fiscal crisis. And on average, we found (coughs) that a country with higher level of corruption, like Greece or Italy, uh, was likely to have a fiscal deficit 
um, which was higher by eight percentage points of GDP than a country which had high levels of integrity like the Nordics and so on. So it made a huge difference even within industrialized countries. So obviously we saw in the data that there was a very strong association. And then we, we, we speculated in, 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 in my writings what are the mechanisms by which corruption does lead to higher um, financial fiscal and fiscal deficits in terms of the lower tax revenue, higher expenditures, wasteful expenditures, the larger informal economy, uh, the also corruption in data, which was a huge issue in, in, uh, in Greece, where you mask the actual uh, financial situation and public debt situation, which also can, can fool the, the markets and, and lead to a, to a worsening of the problem, which is also what happened in Greece. Now, we need to put all these issues in perspective. I find, contrary to the politically correct notion, that corruption does matter and matters significantly mm -hmm. for macroeconomic stability, for good public, healthy public uh, finances, control of corruption is conducive to that as opposed to high levels of, of corruption. But it's not the only factor. There are other technical factors in t which are of a more short-term nature in terms of management of debt and other things. So we need to, to put it in perspective. But my focus was on, in studying that issue. Bottom line, it matters. It matters a lot, but not alone. Uh, when you mentioned this correlation between the budget deficit and high corruption, uh, would you say that the U.S. budget deficit can also be connected with higher corruption, in your opinion? Uh, that's a much more difficult uh, case to, to make. The United States, for a very, very long time, has had a, a deficit, which is too sustainable, basically, because this is a, it, it holds a cor the world currency. It basically has still the enormous confidence of, of foreign investors. So basically, the, the rest of the world is prepared to, to fund and finance mm -hmm. a, a non-trivial part of this, of this fiscal deficit. At what point, because of the increase in the public deficit in the aftermath of the financial crisis and the stimulus program, at what point that may, may become a risky it's a real question nowadays, and that has to be managed. But that I would I would put it more in the cat category of issues of management, which sometimes is is less or more efficient than 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 needed, rather than in the category of high levels of corruption in the United States. In that context, mm -hmm. the corruption issue in the United States and the way it affected the financial situation was very different. So. It, so I'm not suggesting that there was no corruption-related problem in the U.S. related to the, to the financial crisis, which was a global financial crisis, which started 97, 98, but it was of a very different nature, was basically l led by the private sector. And it started on Wall Street, and it was related to what I've, I've called legal corruption right. or capture of the, of the state, okay. which is of a very different nature than the more traditional type of public sector-led corruption, which is, has been more of a Greek, Greece type of problem. Right. Uh, you developed worldwide governance indicators which follow the trends in foreign assistance, governance, and global development. Could you kindly share with the listeners the indicators that you are using and conclusions that you are deriving from this study? Well, there are many studies. First, this, this was, has been a partnership since the mid to late 1990s with my former colleague at the World Bank, Art Cray. We started thinking really hard how to how to better approach and organize the little but very anarchic and disparate data that existed around the world uh, on, on governance when many of the scholars considered the whole issue of governance unmeasurable. And in fact, one could find books and books about governance, but without one data point. So we took on the, the challenge and we started a framework to put together uh, governance indicators in various dimensions, in the uh, political dimension. So we have indicators for voice and democratic accountability and also for political stability in the economic dimension. So we, we have indicators for the 
uh, effectiveness of the government or the bureaucracy as well as of the effectiveness of the regulatory framework or the quality of the regulatory framework and then on on the institutional dimension of governance where we have indicators for the quality of rule of law or the application of rule of law as well as on control of corruption. So corruption was one of the six indicators within these worldwide governance indicators and puts it in, in context because at the end of the day, one does not fight corruption by fighting corruption, just another law or another anti-corruption mm -hmm. commission or just putting one person in jail. It's a much more systemic institutional mm -hmm. reform type of issue. So mm -hmm. one has to look at the rule of law, mm -hmm. at the rest of the governance systems in the country. Is there a voice, democratic accountability? How is, are the regulations in the country? How, what's the effectiveness of the government, transparency, mm -hmm. and so on? And so in that context, we developed that. We have had that since the, the mid-90s. We do it mm -hmm. a, a annually, and there are quite a few results that emerge from that, some of which we have researched and published. But what we are mostly pleased about is that so many other scholars are, are using it, and, and they, mm -hmm. they get uh, academic results out of that. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, Dr. Kaufman, you have mentioned about the importance of the rule of law, and that is so true. Uh, there are so many times when policymakers really focus on anti-corruption laws or measures rather than strengthening the rule of law. Uh, Dr. Kaufman, according to your study, the Worldwide Governance Indicators, uh, sh it shows that on the eve of the Arab Spring, there was a growing democratic governance deficit in the countries where protests emerged and that we should have not been surprised with upheavals in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Syria, and elsewhere in the Middle East if we had paid close attention to the extremely low and deteriorating quality of governance, as you mentioned, in many countries in the region. Can we predict perhaps future upheavals, uh, especially in countries with uh, rigged elections, such as in Russia, and I should mention Croatia as well, uh, as reported by BBC, where some one million illegal votes were there for a country of four million people. Another excellent question. And you know what's a typical Har Harvard answer? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> there are always so many, too many hands. Um, here is the yes is that we need to be much more frank, even if it's politically incorrect, and let the data speak and disseminate and show what the data uh, is, is saying. For too long, the, there were too many quarters, official institutions, and even some scholars that were writing and, and saying and hoping that the Middle East was stable, was going to be like this for a very, very long time, kind of a too bad that was not fully democratic, but they all were rating it as extremely stable. Even after the, f the first Arab Spring country uh, mm -hmm. emerges, which is Tunisia, right. the, mm -hmm. the big articles, big experts in Newsweek, in Time, in foreign policy write no domino effect mm -hmm. after Tunisia. This was an isolated case for those reasons. There is no way something like this can happen in Egypt or in Libya. And there are plenty of articles writing like that. So in that, th that needs to be reviewed. We need to learn the lessons and, and be much more open-minded in looking at, at the bad news, not shooting at the messenger that the data tells us. For a whole decade, of the past decade, from 2000 to 2010, in all these countries in the Middle East, with perhaps one exception, voice and democratic accountability was deteriorating, was not even stable or, as some were claiming, slightly and gradually in improving. So mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. seeds were being planted. So that's the clear lesson part. That's a yes part that we can, we should be able to do better in saying here there is a serious potential problem. There is a predictor of instability. The no part is how incredibly difficult it is to predict the timing mm. of a major a revolution, regime change, of, or some other non-marginal change. So the cases of, of Russia, people have been talking about at what point in, in China the, may, something may happen, That's and at right. some point there is 
some unrest and then it's, it's mass. But the, the, the difficulty there lies as to timing, whether it's next year or, or in 10 years, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to predict. And the data does not tell us. It does tell us, however, that there is a serious problem that should not be put under the rug and pretend that things are getting a little bit gradually better. When you mentioned voice and accountability, how do you come up with that indicator? What are you measuring? We're measuring the extent to which there are civil and political liberties and freedoms in a very broad sense. For for too long, there has been this this trend, both in the literature but also in in in, in popularly in the news, to give a lot of credit to countries that have elections. And as a result, they call it sometimes electoral democracies when it's really a facade. Mm. Um, Increasingly, rulers around the world and because of the way information flows nowadays around the world and international pressures are becoming very clever and even autocrats are holding elections. They make Mm -hmm. sure that they they always win them and the opposition is either non-existent Mm -hmm. or fully... Uh, fully is suppressed. So we felt that it's very important to encompass a broader notion than the old traditional Western notion of democratic elections in, in only the electoral sense. So countries have increasingly having elections, and we, we codify that. Mm-hmm. However, very interestingly, pre- freedom of the press around the world not only has remained stagnant for 20 years, but in many parts of the world has deteriorated. Mm -hmm. Latin America and Africa, if anything, for a number of countries is deteriorating. So in terms of freedom of expression, um, the world is not improving, to the contrary. So that's why uh, we we think it's very important to encompass in this data and in these measures these broader notions so that the full gamut of, of freedoms of expression and, and, and movement, uh, as well as not only political liberties, but civil liberties are included. Mm-hmm. <laughs>